All right, we're going to work a convolution problem in this video example. We're going to work with the continuous time signals. So CT there stands for continuous time signals. The um, X of T and Y of T. So X of T is right here. It is simply a unit step function. So it is 0 for all time. Then at time 0, it turns on. It's equal to 1 for all time after that. And then y of t is this pulse signal right here. It is 0 for all time, but between times 1 and 3, it is equal to 1. And what we are going to do is we're going to compute this new signal, z of t, and z of t is going to be equal to the convolution of x of t with y of t. So this is the symbol that we use for convolution, and we know that that's really just shorthand for solving this integral, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of tau, y of t minus tau, d tau. And just like in the previous examples, the key to being able to work a convolution integral problem like this is to be able to know what these signals look like, what does x of tau look like, what does y of t minus tau look like, and then what does the product look like. Once I know what the product looks like as a function of tau, I can integrate as a function of tau, and I can get out the number for every value of t. So for every value of t, I do this integral, and then I can construct z of t in that manner. So what we need to be able to do is figure out what these signals here in the integral look like so we can sketch them, figure out what their product is, and then find the area of their product. So what is x of tau, and what is y of t minus tau? So let's go ahead and sketch those. Sketching x of tau is really simple because it looks exactly like x of t, Instead of calling things t, though, we call everything tau. So we simply replace all the t's with tau's, and we resketch the signal. So not too surprisingly, x of tau looks just like x of t. We're just using a different variable to index the signal. So that's always the easy one. The one that's a little bit more tricky, though, is y of t minus tau. And to sketch that, I like to break it down into some steps. The first thing I like to do is just sketch y of tau. So what does y of tau look like? Well, just like for x of tau, y of tau looks just like y of t, except we've replaced all the t's with tau's, so it's going to look exactly like y of t, except we've sketched it versus tau. y of tau, though, is not what I want. What I want is y of t minus tau. So as a next step, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and sketch what y of minus tau looks like. So we know what that looks like. It looks just like this original signal, except it's been flipped about the origin. When we go from tau to minus tau, we do a time reversal. So this signal is going to be zero everywhere except between minus three and minus one. It's been flipped about the tau equals zero origin. So that is what the signal y of minus tau looks like. And then we're almost there. We don't want y of minus tau, we want y of t minus tau. So when I add in a t, I'm really shifting this signal by t. So the way that I like to think about that is I like to keep track of the time origin. The time origin right there is tau equals zero. If this signal gets shifted by an amount t, the origin is going to move to t on the tau axis. So when I sketch y of t minus tau, I like to keep track of where that origin is. So I don't label anything yet, I just keep track of zero is going to move to t, so if this is where my origin is, my pulse has to be over here at t minus 1 and t minus 3. So I can go ahead and draw my rectangular pulse right there. And notice I haven't drawn a vertical bar anywhere yet, because based on the value of t, I don't know where it is. If t is actually equal to minus 7, then my time origin would be over here. If t was equal to 11, then the time origin would be over here. So until we know the value of t, we don't know where tau equals zero is. So I usually just leave that off when I sketch y of t minus tau. So now we know what x of tau looks like. We know what y of t minus tau looks like. We know what this product looks like in this integral for different values of t. And that's what we're going to do next. Depending on the value of t, we're going to have a slightly different product here in this integral. So let's go ahead and break it down for different values of t. So the first case that we're going to consider, well, I'll call it case 1, this is the case for a specific value of t, and that value of t we can get by sketching this picture, it's when y of t minus tau hasn't collided yet with x of tau. So depending on the value of t being um, small, y of t minus tau has not collided with x of tau yet, 
So it's when this front edge has not quite gotten to tau equals zero. So I can write that as a mathematical inequality as t minus one is less than or equal to this edge right here, which is zero. So that's this inequality right here. t minus one is less than or equal to zero. I don't have any overlap of these signals. So when I multiply them together, I get zero. And integrating zero is pretty easily easy. When I integrate zero, I get zero. So for the case of t minus one less than or equal to zero, my convolution integral actually is equal to zero. If we rearrange this inequality, if we add one to both sides, we see this is really for the period of time t less than or equal to one. So for all values of t less than or equal to one, our convolution integral is equal to zero. So that's something that we now know about our convolution integral, and I'll just summarize it right there. What about the next case? Let's draw our little cartoon for the next case. This next case, I've slid y of t minus tau a little bit more to the right, so now there is some overlap. This front edge of y of t minus tau has now gone past the origin, but the back edge has not gotten to the origin. So from this cartoon, I can go ahead and draw my bounds again. This little red region is where they do have overlap. When I multiply x of tau times y of t minus tau, I have some overlap. So there will be something to integrate in my convolution integral. From this cartoon, I can go ahead and draw the bounds. It's when the front edge, t minus 1, is past the origin, 0. So here's one inequality I can write. And it's also when this back edge hasn't gotten to the origin. So t minus 3 is less than or equal to 0. If I rearrange these, if I add 1 to both sides, this is for t greater than 1. And if I add 3 to both sides of this, I have t less than or equal to 3. One little check that you can always do is the previous case was for t less than or equal to 1. If you do everything correctly, this has to be for t greater than 1. Everything has to kind of match up at the boundaries. If this one is less than or equal to a value, the next region needs to be greater than that value. So this gives us the region of t that this integral is going to be good for. I can go ahead and write out my integral now. We have a nice picture here of what the product y of t minus tau times x of tau looks like. And the product is simply equal to 1 over the time interval from 0, so that's why my bottom limit is going to be 0, up to t minus 1. So that's why my top limit is going to be t minus 1. On that time interval, I have 1 times 1. So I can just replace x of tau with what it's equal to on that time interval times y of t minus tau, what it is equal to on that time interval. So now all I need to do is integrate 1 from 0 to t minus 1. Well, that's a very easy integral to do. I just get t minus 1. So now we know what z of t is equal to for another case. Finally, what is our last case? I'll draw a little cartoon here. This case is for values of t such that our y of t minus tau has slid completely into x of tau. So I have a lot of overlap now. The most overlap I can have, it overlaps from t minus 3 up to t minus 1. So there will be a product of x of tau and y of t minus tau that's not 0. This is for the case where this back edge has slid, I'm sorry, this is for the case where this back edge has slid past the origin. So this is for t minus 3 being greater than 0. So that's this inequality right here. And it's for the front edge being any value. We really don't care. All we really care is about this back edge having slid past 0. So this last case is going to handle all times greater than 3. Again, this matches up with our previous case. The previous case was t less than or equal to 3. This case is for t greater than 3. So everything matches up just like it should. I can go ahead and write out my convolution integral. The limits here, I'm going to integrate from t minus 3 up to t minus 1, because that's where I have overlap. On that time interval, I have 1 times 1, because that's what these signals are equal to. So I simply need to integrate 1 from t minus 3 to t minus 1, which is tau evaluated at t minus 1 and t minus 3, which gives me t minus 1 minus the quantity t minus 3, which if I go ahead and do my algebra, I subtract all that out and I get 2, which kind of makes sense. Really all I'm doing is I am um, integrating the area of this pulse, and this area of that pulse is always equal to 2. So let's go ahead and um, piece all this together. We've done the three different cases. 
In the first case, we found that z of t, the convolution integral, was equal to 0 for t less than or equal to 1. It was equal to t minus 1 for values of t between 1 and 3. And in this last case, it was equal to 2 for times greater than 3. I can go ahead and sketch what that signal z of t looks like. Here is z of t. It is equal to 0 for t less than or equal to 1. It ramps up between 1 and 3. And then it holds a value of 2 for all times greater than 3. So that is the final answer of our convolution integral that we were wanting to work out. Again, the key to working a convolution integral problem is being able to sketch the components of the integral. You need to be able to accurately sketch x of t and y of t minus tau for all the different possible cases of t. For each value of t, you're, you're going to have a different case. Sketch that cartoon, figure out where they overlap, and then evaluate the integral.